I would like to talk about design as the first signal of human intention. And we've had the good fortune of seeing cradle to cradle design, which I've developed with a German chemist, for the circular economy becoming a, an effectively a standard practice for design that supports the circular economy. And as we heard from Mr. Shia, the fundamental issue here is efficiency, doing more with less, combined with doing the right thing. Because as Peter Drucker, the famous management consultant said, if you're efficiently doing the wrong thing, and you do it perfectly, you become perfectly wrong. And so the question becomes, what is the right thing to do? And then we do it perfectly. And so that's what I'd like to talk about. So we have both efficiency and effectiveness, as we heard. What this means is we're not just counting numbers. We're actually looking at the quality of things. And so it's not just about having less things that are bad. It's also about having more things that are good. And so this becomes human values translated into economic value. Now, the cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach is quite simple in its largest principle. It says that, as we heard, waste is treasure. Everything is food for something else as it is in nature. That we prefer clean energy and we, we like to celebrate new ideas and people coming with their ingenuity and supporting innovation. The design framework is quite simple and very important foundation of design. The first question when you're designing a product, a building, a city, is to look at the idea of is it a biological nutrient or a technical nutrient? This division between biology and technology is very important. So when designing a product that can become part of soil or is attached to human beings, for example, in biology, we want it to be safe, healthy, and usable over and over again. When we design in technology, we want things to be the same thing, safe, healthy, and reusable. And what we want from a television or a computer is the use. What we see, therefore, is service models of equipment where we design them to come back as new resources. So the circular economy puts the re part back into resources. So we start mining what we made yesterday instead of the rest of the world over and over again. See, this becomes a very effective idea and allows us to prosper. The idea would be then that materials are healthy by design and that they're in biological or technical cycles. Secondly, we have a way to get them back and reuse them. Soil, technology, these are the resources we talked about, that waste is, is wealth. And then we have clean energy, clean water, and we benefit society. So if we look simply at ecology or e uh, environment and economics and, and social benefit, we realize that we can see the bottom line of profit in a business, which is take what you have and leave something more profit. That's management, it's reduced risk, and so on. But there's something much bigger here, and this is what I heard uh, Mr. Shia announce, really, is this idea of ecological civilization. That's very interesting, because it asks for more than just more money, less damage. It asks for a way of life. You've mentioned lifestyle. We are going to change the way we live in positive ways and give benefit to many people. So this is really about the top line. This is about revenue growth. We're here to grow. We're here to grow our society, grow our economics, grow our food, grow our cities, grow our benefits for our children and their children. And so this idea becomes one where we look at the environment, social benefit, and the economy together at a very rich level by design. So when we published Cradle to Cradle in China, in 2005, the subtitle was The Design of the Circular Economy. This is 10 years ago. And the idea is to lay a platform that supports innovation, that provide benefits to the present and to the future. So we design what's next into what's now. So any designer looking at a project can say, oh, I'll design this, but what happens next? 
and you design it in. So we talk about not life, oops, excuse me, life cycle only of things like this. These aren't alive. We talk about use cycles. So if you say, what's the next use of this? You design into that rather than what's the next life after it ends its life. It doesn't live. It's there for reuse. And if you design reuse into it, it's much easier to do. And we can and design it as a benefit for all generations. Now, the chart that we use to understand this has been very helpful to many people, I think, which is if you, I don't know if you can see that now. Um, but if you see, we have a, a lot of choices. And as any leader will tell you, life is full of infinite possibilities, but there is no substitute for excellence. So, if we look at the idea of choices, we see we have choices when we choose a material or a system, and then we can decide which ones do things that we want to do less of, and which ones do we want to do things that we want more of, and then we choose against those. So we design le to be less of perhaps carbon in the atmosphere. We design to be more of perhaps carbon in soil. And we want less polluting systems and more non-polluting systems. So it's a transition from where we are today to where our goal is. But our goal is not nothing. Our goal is something positive. Our goal is put together the less bad with the more good and come up with a strategy that lets us move toward our goal. So the idea is to generate value and create the circular economy. We do have to look at the molecules. So we're very careful with the chemistries and we characterize the chemicals based on criteria that scientifically inform us about human and ecological health, about economic benefit, about effects on the environment around the world, and this internationalization, as we heard, of the resources as a way of understanding them and their systems. I'm going to give you a few examples of design that use this quickly to give you a sense of what this is about. When I was asked in 1995 to design a fabric, a textile, when you look at the textile industry, people might get concerned because we have a lot of chemi chemistry, we use a lot of water, we use a lot of temperature. What are we seeing, though? We're seeing here a linear system of take-make-waste. And we send it to the rivers, we send it to the landfills, we send it somewhere away. Take, make, waste. And when we look at this system, in this case, this fabric was, was wool and ramy. These are biological nutrients. We designed it so that the chemistry was so safe, the water coming out of the textile mill was clean enough to drink. And the fabric was so safe, it was chosen by Airbus as the choice fabric for airplanes because it's so clean and so durable. Very interesting. And the waste, which were in Switzerland, had been declared hazardous waste before. Hazardous. Had to be shipped to Spain. Imagine. They now could sell it as mulch for gardeners to put in their soil. So what were the economic benefits? Well, by changing the chemistry of the textiles from 250 chemicals to 38, the company reduced their cost by 20% because they had less inventory to have to manage and increase their profits. They eliminated the cost of disposing of hazardous materials from their, from their fabrics. They reduced their cost of meeting the government regulations in Switzerland. They increased their profits by selling their waste as, as an asset to farmers and gardeners, and they were selected by the customers as the best product, which helps their business. As far as the environment's concerned, the water got clean, the trimmings are supporting local, uh, local uh, uh, farmers. Now, if we look at technical nutrition, an example I'd like to show you here, this was done for Warren Buffett, a very famous business person in the United States. And what we looked at was the fact that in the United States we have 1.4 billion pounds of carpet waste a year. 1.4 billion pounds of carpet, much of it PVC and things like that that cause concern. So if we look at that as a resource, this waste to treasure, why would we take it, make it, sell it, and then throw it away into the atmosphere or into the ground? So instead, they redesigned the textiles of the fabrics as technical nutrition. It comes back and gets made back into carpet. This is an important concept because it sees the carpet as a service 
What you want is comfort under your feet, acoustics, appearance, and so on. This way, you get to store your raw materials on your customers' floors. Imagine that. Because you want it back. It's your product. So you are the cheapest provider of the next carpet also because you're collecting your raw materials. As we heard, the materials become treasure. The waste becomes the treasure of your business. And by doing a new business model, you get, uh, you get economic benefit. This company was number five in the market when they started. It's now number one. That's good news for business by doing this. Um, and they're now the number one largest company, carpet company in the world. They save 10% on materials uh, by, by sell, letting the customers hold them for them, and they encourage customer loyalty. So they reclaim millions of pounds of carpet per year, and the social benefits are that people have carpet and can have jobs, and that can go on for centuries. What a good idea. Now, for furniture industry, we work with Steelcase and Herman Miller, uh, starting 20 years ago, and developed Cradle to Cradle with them. Because instead of throwing out a chair after 10 or 15 years, if you design the chair, which we've done with Steelcase and Herman Miller, to come apart into component parts that are all marked, identified, and we know what they're worth, steel, rubber, aluminum, polypropylene, so on, then you have perpetual assets. And at the end of the use cycle of this chair, it can be dismantled and used as high-level ingredients for the next round. Of, of economic development and industrial design. So the economic benefits are the costs are the same or less. That it reduces environmental costs and footprints and, and uh, allows you to benefit society over and over again with handsome furniture. Now I'd just like to show what happens when someone thinks like this from the beginning. This is a brand new battery that's been announced in the United States. It's in production. It's a battery using cradle to cradle as an idea for how to think about materials. And the engineer who did this from Carnegie Mellon went and said, why would I make batteries out of rare materials that are expensive and potentially dangerous? Even if we can recycle lead, we just want to make sure it doesn't go to the biosphere. Even if we can get lithium, it's, it's tricky to handle, and we're going to we'll have to be careful with it. So he said, what if I use things that humans walked around on for forever? that weren't in any way dangerous or hard to find. And he ended up making a battery out of salt water and paper. Salt water and paper in a polypropylene case. Can you imagine that? Now what does this tell us? This tells us we can have the first cradle to cradle certified battery. A battery that is safe and works really well. Deep cycles, it's, it's quite a, a bit larger than lithium batteries, so it's not for automotive use yet, but it's, uh, but it, it its capacity is terrific, and it has excellent memory properties, so it's perfect for uh, stable use of batteries where you're not in a car, for example, need high compression energy density. But it's, it can be very cheap, because think about it, salt water and paper. I'd like to show another one. This is in China. And this is being done by Sun Power, an American solar company, bought by Total, a French power company, in partnership with Tianjin, Tianjin which is really interesting. And, but the thing I want you to see here is very interesting. Because instead of saying, let's put solar collectors on the ground and shade the soil and make kilowatt hours, what they've done is they've lifted the solar collectors up, and the solar collector itself, right here. So you can change the technology as it gets more efficient with little strips, and the rest of it, the infrastructure, remains and gets used over and over again. and can be recycled, aluminum and steel. But here's what's so interesting. These solar collectors run north-south, which is counterintuitive, but they ro rotate from east to noon to west. So they generate much more energy than being stationary, and they act like trees. And they let the light to the ground, and they shade the ground twice a day. So the fungus and the mushrooms come back, the soil health comes back, the grasses come back, the roots go down five meters, you can graze under it, you can grow vegetables, you can purify soil using effectively fungus as chelation for heavy metals and things like that, research we're seeing. And we can bring back our soils and heal them. We can bring back our water and heal them. We can keep people, there are five jobs, five revenue streams in this picture. People can make money from wool, they can make money from meat, they can make money from fiber, they can make money from cleaning water, they can make money from sequestering carbon. That system puts more carbon in the soil that it takes. So this is a carbon sequestration project 
as well as an energy project. So don't just think of one thing like solar energy. Think of solar energy plus, 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 right? The multiplier effects of good design. Right? So the economic benefits, we design it to be business, or they wouldn't do it. It's a business. Pretty simple. Now, for fun, I just thought I'd talk to you, as I mentioned, and Mr. Shi mentioned, a new idea that we're looking at is the carbon positive building, for example. So NASA asked me to help with the Mars space station design. And I said, what if we start with the International Space Station and we take the design team and we bring them down to Earth? And they say here on Earth that you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do something smart. But what if you were? So they invented the photovoltaic to power this. They purify their own water in space. So what if we brought those technologies to Earth and made a building? So we did this for the same budget as a normal federal office building ahead of schedule. Imagine this. The same budget as a normal building. But the building has an exoskeleton that shades the building and provides column-free structure. But the important thing here for the economics, look at this. This building can provide 120% of the energy it needs between renewable power and a fuel cell. See? Very interesting. So the idea of building is actually productive, providing more, not just less consumption, but it actually is a benefit. It's like having a tree. It's absorbing solar energy and accruing soil. See? It's a, it's in, the emissions are positive. Then we looked at the materials, and they're all looked at down to the molecule for continuous reuse. The economic benefits are quite interesting. We cut water uh, by 71%. In California, we have droughts. This matters. It matters here. Electric lighting. This was nice. The scientists told us, after this is their climate group, told us they only turn on the lights 42 days a year during the daylight hours. Isn't that amazing? They only turn on the lights in 42 days out of the whole year. And the base building, as I said, is the same budget. The building can purify its own water. These are rocket scientists. Um, the landscapes purify water. The air quality is exquisite. So all of a sudden, we realize we can make buildings that are more productive, not just less uh, destructive. Very interesting. Positive carbon positive building. Think about that. So we're now working on carbon positive city concept that I'm introducing. And this is very exciting. This is what we've been talking about. And that's here in China, by the way. So I, I'll show this project for the River Rouge. We were asked by Ford Motor Company to redesign this. This is Henry Ford's industrial facility. It was a 1,000 hectare of industrial facility. And the joke in Dearborn, Michigan, was that this is a color photograph. So if we stop and think about where are we going from here, you know, are we just meant to reduce its footprint? Or perhaps we could do something new. So we ended up doing the world's largest green roof. And we got the technology, had been used for camouflage by the military in East Germany, lightweight green screens that would change colors in the seasons. It was very inexpensive. And so this roof is only seven pounds a square foot. But here's the important thing to understand. That, instead of chemical treatment plants to clean water, did this economically. The conventional treatment plant to meet the law in the United States on this site was $48 million worth of chemical plants, three chemical plants, kilometers of pipes. Instead, we use these green systems. They cost $13 million. So Ford saved $35 million the first day. $35 million in savings the first day doing the green roof instead of reducing the damage. Isn't that interesting with chemicals? One day, and just think of it this way. If the Ford car is at a 4% margin, that is the same as walking into the board and saying, I'm coming in to give you an order for $900 million worth of cars. That's what you're doing, you see? No company will not take that deal. One day, an order for $900 million worth of cars, same profit, amazing. Okay? So this design is very practical, very practical. You just have to do it and think hard about it together with teams. So here in, uh, for Procter & Gamble, we have a, a 300,000 square, square meter factory in Taichung, and it's 100% wind powered. And we found a way to do it, working with the, with the state grid, with the wind turbine companies, with the utilities, because it ends up providing Procter & Gamble with energy, energy security. And when you have 300,000 square meters of shampoo in pipes, you don't want that to be turned off. 
because it takes two weeks to turn it back on. So energy security becomes very valuable. Of course it does, you see? So you look for where are the numbers and how do you create benefit? This is a new factory in India that's just under construction. You see it's finished now. But well, we took all the structure, put it on the roof, so it's not in the way of the factory. There's no ducting, it's just empty. The building is pressurized, so we, it breathes out. And we do eight things with every BTU of natural gas. We make energy, electricity, we make heat for the drying plant, we make cooling for the factory, we grow food on the roof. It's covered with greenhouses and solar collectors. We grow food, we make more jobs on the roof, they grow their own food. It's quite amazing. And the carbon dioxide is used to grow food. We have oxygen, and that's used inside the building. And it's really quite, quite astonishing. So design is the first signal of human intention. What is our intention for the future? To be bad? Well, then we can just keep doing what we're doing. To be good? I would hope so. To be more good? That would be nice. To be less bad? Of course. Let's do all those things together. But let's have an intention that, just like China was able to farm its land for 5,000 years, can you imagine that? 50 centuries of farming, watching the soil health, putting the carbon back in soil, watching the nitrogen phosphate balance. Farmers knew how to do this. And here we are now with our high-tech equipment and all the rest of it. So we can bring these things to our industries. And as we heard, if China is going to have green buildings and so on, I'm pleased to announce that the credit credit certification, which we gave to the public, is now the choice of the U.S. Green Building Council. You get two points in our green building system in the United States for credit credit certified materials, healthy materials. It's two material health points, one for the quality of the materials, the other for the fact that they're constantly improving. So to summarize, we, we look at the effects of this design. And with China's economy being so critical, obviously, and everyone else's, the important thing is to remember, this is not in addition to what you do today as an added cost. This is integral to good business. And so you approach it this way. So part of it is reduced cost, of course. Very practical, moving ahead. We simplify supply chains. Just imagine if you're running a business and you have 38 dyes instead of 249. You're saving money because you have less inventory. You have less paperwork. We reduce liabilities while increasing benefits. These materials are safe, so you're not at risk of being hurt by regulation. You're not at risk of your customers saying there's a new standard for health in Europe and you can't sell your product into Europe anymore because you're not paying attention to these issues. You want to be ahead of these things. When they come and say, we want this, you say, yes, we know how to do this for you. And then you anticipate global customers' demands by increasing quality and transparency because the world is asking for that. Why shouldn't China have the finest product quality in the world in 20 years? Imagine if Made in China stands for the highest quality products in the world. That's part of your competitive advantage is at a point when labor costs are always changing around the world. When you can say we are the quality, we meet the highest standard because that's how we think, that's what we can do. You align with your national goals for a circular economy. You create a clear framework for your innovation so your people are rewarded for new things. And we create a market differentiation and competitive advantage. But remember about competition. In English, the word comes from the Latin com patare, which means together, com patare, walk. It means walk together. So to compete doesn't mean kill each other. It means walk together and go forward. So it came from the Greeks. The Greek cities were fighting all the time, and they were killing each other. And one day, they said, let's stop killing each other, because someday the Persians will come, and we will be weak. We will have killed each other, and we will lose. And so they decided to create the Olympics. And the Olympics allowed everybody to get out, throw things, throw sharp sticks, lift heavy weights, run around in circles, and all get fit together. And so some people win, some people lose. Nobody gets hurt, and everybody gets better. So this is the circular economy. Thank you.